Hey folks, attorney Andrew Branca here from Law of Self-Defense. Obviously not recording from the office today. I'm on the road, but I wanted to share with you this uh, really fantastic video sent to us by our good friend, colleague, uh, the uh, provost of American Law Courses, attorney Steve Gosney. He's done a, what he's calling a final analysis of the Aaron Dean trial. Aaron Dean being the former Fort Worth officer recently convicted of reckless manslaughter in the shooting death of a Tatiana Jefferson, unjustly convicted in my professional opinion. But Steve has a final analysis of the trial in which he answers a lot of the questions that were raised, sent his way from his prior analysis of the, of the case, as well as some uh, other closing thoughts. So with that out of the way, I will now introduce all of you once again, to attorney Steve Gosling. If you've ever wondered what it would be like to have a lawyer-like understanding of the many high-profile trials and legal issues we cover, well, I've got exciting news. Our very own American Law Courses offer a wide variety of law school-level courses, including the foundational courses all lawyers take in their first year of law school at a fraction of the cost and time of law school and without the toxic political environment that so pervades law schools today. At American Law Courses, we simply teach traditional American law in the traditional American way to help Americans become the best informed, most capable citizens they can be. We have a broad curriculum of courses, including criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, property, constitutional law, and more. All courses are taught on a semester basis, roughly one live-streamed class a week for 14 weeks with an optional final exam for certification at the end. Every class is taught by a genuine legal expert in the respective subject, and because the classes are live-streamed, there's plenty of opportunity for real-time interaction and Q&A with the professor. If you can't make a particular class for some reason, no worries. Every class is also made available as a recorded playback, and you have access to that recording for a full year. We're currently in the pre-registration period for the spring 2023 semester, which starts the second week of January. And during this pre-registration period, you can save 50% on any and all American law courses. That's a savings of over $1,000 a course. So if you'd like to learn more, now would be the time to do so. Learn more about our American law courses, access the syllabus for each course, view interviews with our professors, and much more by simply pointing your browser to AmericanLawCourses.com today. Hello, Rumblers and uh, Andrew Bronca fans, Law Self-Defense fans, and anybody who watched the uh, the breakdown of the Aaron Dean trial, uh, closing argument that I did for the Law Self-Defense. And uh, there's been a number of follow-ups we've been kind of this has been log rolling we covered that whole trial and uh i i commented on the closing arguments portion of that trial and then andrew of course did his little funny bleep bleep all the problems and objections that that we spotted in the closing argument the first 15 minute closing argument the state did i think we counted over 66 and then of course then i did a, a more complete breakdown of that of all the reasons and the objections that I thought and why I thought those object those places were objectionable. Basically, everything was objectionable except for one paragraph. So, um, and you know, and some of and I and like I said in the video, some were stronger than others uh, as far as a uh, whether the objection would be sustained at the trial level. It's an open question about whether they'd be sustained, and of course, it's a Texas law question. Um, I, I analyzed it. I gave the reasoning why I thought they were objectionable. And there were some that were really outside the box and there were some that were closer calls. So, um, but then because the, I was looking at the comments section on that video and there's a lot of, um, follow up type questions that people had. And so I thought I would produce this as sort of a book ending, closing, finishing this whole idea and all this whole thought. To go through it and answer some of the questions that I thought were not answered in the actual video that were posted in the chat. And, um, William Parker suggested that we do this. He's one of uh, our Andrew Law self defense guys. Um, but I wanted to say that what we're doing there is issue spotting. Okay. So the first skill, I'm an appellate lawyer. I do criminal appeals in Florida. The first thing an appellate lawyer does is issue spot. 
And that's kind of what I was doing. That's what I was doing when I was looking through this closing argument. I was looking at every possible issue, every possible objection that could be had on that. Now, that's just the first step in an appellate process. So the way it would go in, so if I was, there were other other appellate issues in this case. For example, the the woman testifying from like 18 years ago when she was 18 and she was, he was 19 and he comes up to her and, and says, you're beautiful and puts his hands on her or something. And I think he pokes her in the breast over the clothes at one point. And then she goes away and uh, charges him with assault and he pleads to assault. This whole dust up that happened, you know, when he was a college student 20 years ago or whatever, to bring that up as a sentencing aggravator, I thought was very odd. Now, I don't know Texas law, but I don't think that would fly in Florida. First of all, there's a look back. So if you go if you go 10 years without being on supervision of any kind, any of those prior records are basically wiped off the board and can't be scored against you in a in a sentencing in Florida. That's Florida law, of course. Um, so the fact that, first of all, it's very old, it's very different. It's it's a it was a strange thing. So but, you know, so, for example, that to me might be an area of appeal for Mr. Dean. All right. Um, but let's focus on the closing arguments, because clo- how would a, how would a, an appellate lawyer, a criminal appellate lawyer frame the issues? All right. Well, first thing is you're going to take every possible objection that are that, that everything in that closing argument listed out like I did and then put it on some sort of sheet or put it down in writing like we did and explain why the objections are good. Maybe maybe you group those into subsets of of generic themes or closings, but uh, how would you take those issues and then transform them into an appeal? And how does that appeal go forward? So let's, let's talk about that. All right. Um, Well, the first, the first thing is um, the, the big one, the big one is the misstatement of law. And I think if Mr. Dean has any hope of getting a, a reversal based on improper closing arguments it would be because of the um, the misstatement of law that I think was bought into by the defense attorney. I don't really see any reason. Now, there's a commenter, Dana Hardesty, who pointed us to a Texas case. Again, I'm a Florida lawyer looking at it from Florida eyes and how I would deal with that case in Florida. But he, he pointed to a case called uh, Jordan v. State, which is 593 Southwest 3rd, 340. Texas Criminal Appeal 2020 that correctly states the um, the law in Texas, and here I will I will quote from that: the evidence does not have to show that the victim was actually using or attempting to use unlawful deadly force. Okay, so the the evidence does not does not have to show the victim was actually using or attempting to use unlawful force, which is what they thought in this case, right? Because a person has the right to defend himself from apparent danger as he reasonably apprehends it. Okay, and that is a critical factor because we all agree that the the victim in this case was not operating. She was not actually using or attempting to use unlawful deadly force. She was acting lawfully. And that's what makes this case so difficult. But see, that's not the question. The law in Texas, according to this case, is that a person has a right to defend himself from apparent danger as he reasonably apprehends it. So that is the correct statement of law. So the misstatement of law gave him an unfair trial, all right? And that that would be sort of, I would break that out into a separate merit point if I was doing his appeal, all right? So that would be just the misstatements of law. Um, now, the next question was, could Dean have had elected a bench trial instead of a jury trial? where a judge would be less likely to be swayed by prosecutors' emotional appeals and fooled by their courtroom shenanigans. Well, again, in Florida, <laughs> in Florida, it takes both parties must consent to a bench trial. All right. So if one party objects, then they don't get it. Now, generally, as a criminal lawyer, you want juries because judges tend to be very calloused and they they don't want to um they, they're they're influenced by a lot of factors. I would rather, much rather, have a jury uh, coming as a criminal defense lawyer. Now, this case is a special case because of the political influences. I don't know this judge. You really have to know your judge. There's a lot of factors that go into that. But um, sometimes, 
in Florida, it takes two parties to demand a bench trial. If if one party objects, it can't have it. All right. Um, the next question was, how good a case does Dean have for suing his attorneys for malpractice? Well, probably none, because he was convicted. And I, I I would say that he needs to get deal with first things first. Okay, so he's in prison for 10 years, but he's got a malpractice claim against his attorneys? I don't think so. I mean, the first thing he's got to do is get out of his criminal case. That is, um, that boat is a long way away. Uh, it's very hard to sue a criminal defense lawyer for malpractice. Let's just put it that way. So I don't, that, and I don't really know, is that really the top priority for Mr. Dean at this point? I think his top priority is to get out of his criminal sentence. All right. Um, now here's some other questions from the chats that I'll, I'd like to kind of answer. And these are all go to good issues that I want to address. So it's not just answering chats, it's discussing issues in the case. All right. Patriot Pope. Why did the judge allow the prosecutor to get away with such blatant corruption of the law and disregard for ethical courtroom procedures? He could have set aside the verdict since it was an obvious miscarriage of justice instigated by prosecutorial maliciousness <laughs> and facilitated by the incompetence of the defense counsel. Okay, so that's a, a lot of big words there. But what he's saying is, why didn't the judge step in? All right, that's the, why didn't the judge step in? All right, well, first of all, judges will usually, they're, they're the umpire. They're going to let the, the plays call balls and strikes. If they aren't, if there was no complaint, if there was no objection by the by any party, they're just going to let it run. Now it's it's a passive thing, but that's what. Now I would say that the judge, I believe, should have stepped in at least on the legal misunderstanding. There are precedents by which I think a judge should step in and cut these things off at the knees. But either sometimes judges aren't even aware that it's misconduct. I, one of the articles I wrote in the book, IDs and Answers in Law, which, of course, you can get on my crimelaw.net, um, is about prosecutorial misconduct. And the uh, a lot, I wrote it because one of the judges who I greatly respect, who's a criminal law, top criminal law judge, well, I was objecting on closing arguments, and he was like, oh, I'm, I'm overruling those. He didn't even understand the law as closing arguments as it went. I was shocked because he's one of our top guys. So the fact that you would expect the judge to know this, judges get appointed, they get elected. They don't necessarily, are not necessarily the best lawyers or anything. They, you don't know what this judge is. Secondly, they're used to being passive. They don't want to get involved in the dispute. They want to remain above it. And um, one of the cases, let me see, what's the name of the case? It was the beady eyed crackhead case, and everybody, everybody in our jurisdiction of it, the crew, Jerry Crew case in the fifth. And one of our judge, justices on the fifth DCA, Wendy Berger, um, in that case, it was reversed for fundamental error in prosecutorial misconduct. All right, for, for just all over the place, mostly unobjected to closing arguments that were way outside the bounds. And she wrote a concurrence in the Jerry Crew case that said, this was so bad the judge should have stepped in. And I think that's the proper proper stance of a judge, but easy for us mortals <laughs> to say such things, right? But the fact is, is that judges generally don't. That's a very rare thing. Now, I've had, I remember the great judge Richard O. Watson was my hero judge, and, and I practiced in front of him a lot. He would have stepped in because he was very aggressive. He was like, counselor, step to the bench. And then he would like, where are you going with this, counselor? Isn't that a golden rule argument? I'm going to limit you right there. Okay, go back. And, you know, and then he'd turn to the jury and say, now I'm instructing the jury to ignore those last comments. Move on, counselor. I mean, he was really tough and great. Um, but the question about why doesn't the judge step in, it's very unusual for judges to step in. Let's put it that way. All right. Um prosecution should know this. Okay, so here's um S. Delano said, the prosecutor should know this. They should know they are caught and called out for the mishandling. If they're willing to do this for this case, imagine all the other innocent or borderline cases they've done the same thing on. And, and that's right. I mean, the fact is, is that I'm sure this is a regular, this isn't a first time fence. I, they, I'm sure this is the way they practice. So it's really a lynch mob kind of mentality. And it shouldn't be in a court of law. It, it's not proper. So um, I, I remember one case I had that, in fact, the case that inspired the thing with the judge I was telling you about, who was really good. And he was overruling my objections. I remember I was objecting and the prosecutor was like, 
I've never had somebody object in my closing arguments before, like offended that I would object. Well, that's my job. I'm calling it out. I'm, my job as a defense attorney is to call out error. And the judge is called to, call to imply the law and to focus on the law. So the fact that it hasn't been done before doesn't mean it's not the law. It just means that people aren't competent. Lawyers aren't competent in these things, and they aren't used to it. Um, okay, Snarky says, when defense counsel fails to object and thereby preserves grounds for appeal, could the defendant have raised the objection himself? No. He's represented by counsel. If the defendant tried to get up and object, the judge would thoroughly admonish him. That would not work at all. Okay. Um, it's a shame Dean had read the books written by Andrew and Steve. Yes, I agree. Um, okay. And leaving the defense entirely in the hands of an incompetent or uncaring attorneys. I don't know if they're incompetent or uncaring. I would say they were not educated. And one of the things about this book, people say, is it only for lawyers? Is it only for lawyers? No, it's for everybody because sometimes lawyers have a lot of different cases, a lot of different things they're doing. Now, you would expect the highest competence, but you may learn something. If you are in a situation, you have a bit of knowledge and you'd said, hey, you know, I read in Gosney's book about this, this and this. And then give it to your lawyer. And, you know, maybe the, the situation comes up, says, you know, did you know this? Have you thought about this? And the lawyer may not have thought at it. So, you know, you are a team and it is your life on the line. So there is a benefit for you knowing these things. Just like otherwise just say, well, I'll just leave it. I'll just hire some random lawyer and hopefully they'll know everything. Well, nobody knows everything. So. Um, so I guess that that's it. But the fact is, he's not you can't object on your own. Okay, It takes the lawyer to do that. Uh, Larry Bo Boyle says, holding he, he has a quibble with the holding accountable argument, saying that in California, they routinely use the language without objection. All right. Well, first of all, just because it's not objected to doesn't mean it's proper. It just means it's getting not objected to. Right. So it may be wrong. But since nobody's objecting to it, it's not getting called or or I will also say that I said that not every objection that I pointed out was the strongest. And I'd say you could put holding accountable within a context of beyond a reasonable doubt and the proper standard and say that you hold him accountable by beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. You could probably frame that and it would be okay. It's not the best language, but it would be okay. You know, it, it depends on how it's being used. So I think the way this prosecutor was using it was you need to hold him accountable for this community purpose and because he's not taking responsibility and for demanding a jury and all these improper reasons, rather than saying we must hold him criminally accountable for a culpable mens rea and for a culpable mind. So, you know, it, it's I'd say that that's that's a tougher call. It's it's not, you know, there's there's the strongest and the weakest arguments, and that's not the strongest. I don't know if it's the weakest, but but there's a gradient of how good some of these arguments are I'm making. I'm just pointing out objections and letting you be the judge. And this is issue spotting. It wouldn't be my final brief or my final call on everything. In fact, you, I, as an appellate lawyer, I would wean out the weakest or, or at least break them out so that I could put Put them on task, say, okay, we've got the misrepresentations of law, we've got the golden rule, and then and bring out maybe multiple points and then say, and then there's a totality of the thing. I would have a totality argument. So you'd have multiple points that would raise these different issues um, and then say, and then look at it in context. It's an unfair overall trial. So um, anyway, so you can, again, you can quibble with my various objections. I have no problem with that. But believe me, I just, I'm just saying it like I see it. Okay, um, Laura Thompson, Thomason says, after watching Steve in the video, I'm curious what judge power the judge has. Laws misstated the judge to make sure it's being followed. Yes, and, and like I said, the judge could, if I if the judge was really on top of it, he should have clarified this. He should have said, um, counselor, would you approach? And then the counselor comes up, he says, um, now, this is my understanding of the law. Maybe even excuse the jury. Say, uh, you know, my understanding of the law is that it doesn't matter if she was acting unlawfully. Is that your understanding of the law, counselor? Right? And maybe question that. And 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 if appropriate, say, well, that that's not the law. That's not my understanding of the law. The law is this. Make sure you argue within these bounds. I mean, the judge could have done something like that if he was fully on top of the law, which I'm not certain he was, okay? 
um, is really need a defense attorney in this case. It's on top of this self-defense. They really, to have somebody like Andrew in the background would have been the, the best thing for them. They really needed that advice badly. Okay. Tom Crawford says, and this is all from the comments, so I'm not outing anybody. These are people that posted on their names on the comments section of the video. Um, a technical question about Texas trial procedure, which I won't know, but um, contemporaneous objections. So the argue, he asks about contemporaneous objections. Um, does that mean that every time the prosecution made an improper argument, they had to be interrupted at that moment with an objection? Or would it have been better to raise it later? Okay, well, yes. The answer to that is yes. It has to be contemporaneously objected, not only objected to then, has to be specifically objected to on one of the grounds. So that's why I wrote that article as a tool mark, for, a tool for defense attorneys. So they could have those seven points right next to them. So it can be contemporaneously objected to, number one, and number two, specific, specifically objected to. So you can say objection golden rule violation, objection, misstatement of law, objection, burden shifting, right? Objection, appeal to community conscience. So, and you could have multiple objections all in the one. So yes, the, the answer is yes, it needs to be objected to. And also I will note as an interesting side point, the objections have to be overruled or, in, or if they're sustained, then the defense attorney has to ask for a mistrial. So every time that happens, a defense attorney should stand up, say, objection, golden rule violation, sustained. Your Honor, we'd ask for a mistrial. Okay. I'm not going to allow a mistrial. Okay. Then we want an admonishment on the prosecutor and a curative instruction without giving up our right to appeal. This is the way Florida works it. They are getting stricter and stricter and stricter about contemporaneous objections that must be legally on point because appeals only check the judges. All right. And, and the judge's rulings on the law. So if the judge overrules, then it's preserved because you've made the objection. It was overruled. You never got a remedy. If it's sustained, then you want a mistrial because what's the remedy? Well, if you say, Your Honor, um, objection, sustained. And then it just moves on. Well, you didn't ask for any remedy. You have to ask for a remedy and that remedy has to be denied. So and the remedy you want is mistrial because you want a new trial at the end of the game, at the appellate game. So that's the way it works. And so when you say, I want a mistrial, they say, I'm not giving you a mistrial. You say, well, we would want a mistrial and we won't remedy our error, but we would like you to admonish the prosecutor and instruct the jury on the proper law. That's the way it has to be done. Um, now, he says, does, does Aaron Dean have any grounds for appeal? Yes. Yes. But it's a, it's a long shot because of the fact that it looks to do, doing a brief, and I'm not a Texas lawyer, but looking at the, the case law briefly in Texas, just sort of prepping for the case and for what I was doing here, not only does it have to be objected to, if you don't, it's a waiver. So the failure of the defense to object is, is almost fatal to his appeal. It's a long shot. It's a very high bar. Now, in Florida, we call it fundamental error. It has to reach down to the fundamental fairness. Now, I would argue that this trial, this closing argument did reach to a fundamental ground. And I would argue as such on appeal if I was his appellate lawyer. But that is a very high bar to clear. And I will say that most courts would not entertain this. Um, I don't know. It's a media case. I, I don't know the politics of Texas. I don't know the appellate courts in Texas, any of that. I'll, I, you know, I would argue it as his attorney, but the chances have gone way down for him because it was not contemporaneously objected. Okay. Um, and then the Tom also says, I used to work for a Virginia trial court judge who had no tolerance for interrupting counsel's closing arguments with objections. His standard line is, you'll have your chance to speak next. And that was 40 years ago. And that is the old school judging way. And this guy looks like an old school judge to me. And I've, I've dealt with those people that they felt that, you know, it's the good old boy network and we're all here. We're all professionals and we don't object at closing. That, that is sort of a judge rule. Like let them argue what they want. Well, that, that day has long since passed. Okay. First of all, the appellate courts have been damn clear that if you don't object, during closing, specifically and contemporaneously, you waive the appeal. And like here, the whole thing is is about this improper closing argument. So 
he should should well object. The appellate courts are demanding it of the defense attorneys. And so these judges that have this old school opinion that everybody's all getting along, well, these prosecutors are not playing by the rules. And the only the only remedy you have is to protect yourself for the law with a defense attorney who objects. So that that ship has long since sailed. And um does and and but judges do have that. It's like they want this old world that doesn't exist anymore. And the appellate courts, that is not the law. The law is you don't object in closing. If that was true, then I couldn't write that whole chapter. The whole chapter is full of cases that were closing argument objections that should have been sustained. Well, if you can't object, then that would never have happened. So that's just an it's a misstatement of of what should happen by the judges, trial judges. And they like to say that, but you got to stand up and fight that battle. I mean, if a judge thinks that, I'd have a long talk with him about it. <laughs> Um, and he talks about the danger of cops just sitting in their patrol cars protecting no one. Yes, that is a big danger uh, and a societal cost to this type of prosecution. Um, now, Alex Landsman says, I think we're all hopelessly behind the times leaving the classical jurisprudence applies today and teaching studying is relevant. Any modern lawyer must be media savvy, skilled in jury selection, Master at innuendo, character assassination, etc. Well, you lost me on those last two. These are the main ingredients of successful conditions, convictions, and acquittals. Creative lawyers introduce these practices into our justice system, and now they have completely taken over. So face reality and stop teaching people all your window dressing legal gobbledygook and start defending with the new tools of justice that are applicable today, not in the last century. Uh, and then there was a comment that said, uh, sadly, you may be right agreeing with that. Well, Alex, uh, thanks for your comment. I don't agree, first of all. Um, and, and we just got done saying that that is not the law. Well, I'm following the law. And a courtroom is a place of law. The the um, I would agree that a lawyer needs to be media savvy and skilled in jury selection. But master of innuendo and character assassination and that this is just gobbledygook, legal gobbledygook, and we got to come into this new world. So you're suggesting that we should enter into the world of the prosecutor and that the defense attorney should be playing these mudslinging games. Well, first of all, that's a betrayal of the prosecutorial role, and that is not the law when it comes to prosecutorial conduct. They, that is absolutely not the law, and the law has not been repealed. The law still exists. The rule of law is essential. It's so important. If that is the case of sad reality in courtrooms, then we need to do everything in our power to push against that. We, everybody, everybody listening to this chat, and and as far as like abandoning all hope and entering into a world of communist voting where we all slander each other and it's just a popularity contest, that's not a world of law. And that's a world of popularity. And it is not, I, I just completely disagree that we need to get over it. now. Doesn't mean you can't be effective using emotions. Uh, they could have been the, the state could have been effective using emotions. So could the defense. You can play by the rules and still be make powerful emotional arguments, but it has to be within the bounds of law. When it's outside the bounds of law, then we have lost the rule of law. And rule of law protects us all. It protects us all, and we need to fight. It's not something. There has been no legislation changing anything that I'm saying. The way I'm saying may be old school, but it's old school as in 1776, 1789, as founding of this country, constitutional rights. That is the grounding by which we argue. That's the grounding by which courts exist. To undermine the rule of law is to, why even have a court at all? Let's just have a shootout in the OK Corral. Let's just have a, um, a popularity contest where everybody votes who the ugly person is and they get voted off the island. I mean, why have a court at all if, if we're just going to abandon all these legal principles? So, Tom, respectfully disagree with that one. Um, now, let's let's go back here. I had some other notes. Those are some of the comments. Let's see. So we've got we talked about the idea of waiver and fundamental error and ineffective assistance at trial counsel. Ineffective assistance at trial counsel or appellate counsel, for that matter, is based on something called the Strickland Standard. You can look at, it's a United States Supreme Court case, look up ineffective assistance of counsel, Strickland, and it's a two-pronged test, and it involves, it has, you have, it's a very hard bar to clear. Let's just say that. So, um, I don't see why the, that's why I think the misunderstanding of the law is the most effective. 
uh, attack on the judgment here because there's no reason for the defense counsel to have misread that law other than um, there's no like legal, technical, tactical reason. Because sometimes you can say it's a tactical um, reason not to object. All right. Um, now let's talk about the appellate process. So, so selecting the merit points. So we'd be issue spotted. And what you would do is if I was had this appeal, I would then go back and I'd take all these arguments, I'd put them together, put quotes, looks, look at which ones read the best and which ones had the most support in law and break them out and make those arguments in a merit brief. I may ditch some of those arguments that I made, like the one that the fellow was talking about, I forget which what it was, the um about uh upholding accountable. Well, that might be one that gets laid aside, or it might get one that gets grouped into the entire closing argument was bad, but then make a specific legal merit point on the, the misstatement of law, for example, or the call for a community conscience. You know, you, I would definitely prioritize which ones are the strongest and which ones are the weakest and focus on your strongest and either buffer the, the weaker ones with the totality of the circumstance or delete them entirely. So that is a winnowing process that must be done from the appellate, and that's an appellate attorney judgment kind of question. Anyways, so that's sort of a final wrap up. And I, I, I was going to do a grading on this, but I, it's it's hard for me to grade this. I would definitely give the, I give the state. Well, let's let's go ahead and give it a shot, and I'll just talk about why it's hard to grade. I would give the state, the prosecutor in the dean trial, as a grade. Uh, probably a D minus. And I will say a D minus, I, I would not give them an F because I think they were effective emotionally. Um, the presentation was clean. They obviously knew their courtroom. I mean, I'm talking the clean as in rehearsed. It was delivered cleanly, right? These are not stupid lawyers. They know what they're doing. This was very done very consciously. I'm sure she wrote out her points. She she practiced them. She's done this before. So that prosecutor is not stupid, not unskilled. So they're not going to get an F because they have some skill. But as far as I think the ethics and the following the law and the all of the substance that was done, I think it was completely out of bounds. So and and it's the prosecutor. I don't care how bad the defendant is, how bad the defense attorney is, how nasty and how unfair the prosecutor thinks the defense is acting. That does not justify ever the state playing unfair. The job of the state is to uphold the law and upholding the law means following the law in the face of lawless behavior by defense. The defendant is there because they're lawless to begin with. Right. So you're there as a prosecutor to uphold the law. So um, so I'm going to give this prosecutor a D minus defense attorney. I think I'd give them tough. Um, I'll, and I'm just focusing on the closing arguments. Maybe that's the thing. I'm, I'll give them a D minus because they should have caught all this stuff. Now, technically, they were they presented. I think they're well, again, here, the, the cross of the one expert was good. They did put on their own expert, was which was good. One of their experts was excellent, I thought. Um, but the closing missed the boat. They were, it was lacking in emotional appeal. It was lacking in theming, did not have a consistent theme. It was not memorable. It had it lacking in emotional impact. Um, I, I was, it was too long. Um, I don't know, maybe a D, uh, the judge it's in, see this, it's hard to, it's hard to say with a judge because the judge did sustain the one defense objection and did grant them a proper remedy that was asked for. So that judge may have been waiting for the objections that never came. Um, I had thought he was, had a very good control of his courtroom. Obviously, the attorneys were very respectful, and I don't think they were out of bounds in anything. And that, that shows a, a well-maintained courtroom. Should he have stepped in? I think so. I think he should have stepped in. He misread the law like the rest of the parties, I think, on the legal, on the stand your ground issue or the self-defense, the justifiable use of force issue. Um, so it's hard for me to know this judge. I, I don't know. Um, I, I think he should have stepped in. Points off for that. So let's start with an A. Let's assume I liked his demeanor generally, but let's let's give him a point off for not just stepping in and disciplining his courtroom on, on that. He did sustain the objection, though. So 
Uh, tough call. He let that improper law go. I don't know what's up with this ruling allowing that woman to testify. That seemed absolutely bizarre to me. Um, I don't know. It's, it's very hard to say. Maybe a B minus? Maybe a C plus? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's easy to look at the outcome. I'm trying to judge it. It's a, and I just don't know about enough about the law, the courtroom, what things were presented pre-trial. There's a lot of unknown questions there. Um, so I'm just grading off for a few of those points that that happened. But the thing is, is that most judges would not step in. So that doesn't put him out of the category. Now, the, the A-plus judge would, right? The A-plus judge would. Um, so it's hard. And, I, you know, judicial demeanor was good. Hard to say. That's a, he's a hard one to judge. So I'm gonna maybe I'll just put a question mark there. Incomplete. <laughs> if I had to, maybe B minus C plus, but um I, I think that that's a hard one. Anyways, um sad to see uh such bad closings. And those are my thoughts. And I'm a Florida lawyer, not a Texas lawyer, not my case, just commenting. But I thought some of those questions that were raised in the chats were good questions and legitimate questions. And uh thought I'd give you a little bit more on the Dean trial. Aaron Dean wrap up with grading on the end. I fudged on the judge grade, but can't can't fully comment on that. All right. So thank you all for everything. Um buy the book, Ideas and Answers in Law with attorney Andrew Bronca doing the forward. And I would also suggest American law courses. We've got evidence coming up. And I'll put the in the link below if you want to sign up and sign up under my name, Steve. And I'll be teaching criminal law coming up. I've got, we got a line on a good con law professor. We've got evidence and property coming up, which is going to be great in January. Sign up before the end of the year. You get a big discount and sign up under my name, if you would. So thank you all for paying attention and stay true. If you've ever wondered what it would be like to have a lawyer-like understanding of the many high-profile trials and legal issues we cover, well, I've got exciting news. Our very own American Law Courses offer a wide variety of law school level courses, including the foundational courses all lawyers take in their first year of law school at a fraction of the cost and time of law school and without the toxic political environment that so pervades law schools today. At American Law Courses, we simply teach traditional American law in the traditional American way to help Americans become the best informed, most capable citizens they can be. We have a broad curriculum of courses, including criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, property, constitutional law, and more. All courses are taught on a semester basis, roughly one live-streamed class a week for 14 weeks with an optional final exam for certification at the end. Every class is taught by a genuine legal expert in the respective subject, and because the classes are live streamed, there's plenty of opportunity for real-time interaction and Q&A with the professor. If you can't make a particular class for some reason, no worries. Every class is also made available as a recorded playback, and you have access to that recording for a full year. We're currently in the pre-registration period for the spring 2023 semester, which starts the second week of January. And during this pre-registration period, you can save 50% on any and all American law courses. That's a savings of over $1,000 a course. So if you'd like to learn more, now would be the time to do so. Learn more about our American law courses, access the syllabus for each course, view interviews with our professors, and much more by simply pointing your browser to AmericanLawCourses.com today.